Hey everyone, Spike here with Spike Reviews and uh, ManyShout.com. I'd like to virtually welcome you, uh, the one and only Josh Martin, uh, the voice of our lovable pink friend Majin Buu and one of the members of the Beastie Boys tribute band, Rhyming and Stealing. How are you, Josh? I'm well, how are you? Thanks for having me. Doing pretty good. Thank you for your time once again. Uh, Absolutely. I know these times are crazy, so it seems like everything going on now is just gonna be virtual for a while. <laughs> it's craziness. Uh, just been uh, hanging out the house with uh, the family, the wife and uh, kids, three children, uh, adapting to homeschooling and, uh, and working from home, mm -hmm. doing auditions and, you know, all that stuff. How about you? Uh, pretty much just trying to, like, since I'm not working now, I'm trying to uh, catch up with my own goals because working 10 hours a day, you don't have that much time to work on your own personal things. So exactly kind of, so this situation has its pros and cons just like yourself now you get to spend more time with the family which is which is a good thing it's a silver lining for sure that's it you got to take the positives out of every situation you know exactly. no matter how how bad things can get yeah there's always a light silver, silver lining for sure <laughs> yes yeah right all right, let's get started with something from your past uh, that a lot okay. of people might may not know about. So in the 90s, you were the voice of Bar Barney the Dinosaur. Were you the voice or just no. the... Uh, no, I was the body talent. The body I talent. I was one, one of three body talents at the time, by the time I got on there. Uh, it was 96. 96. And I, I got hired on for the world tour, Barney's Big Surprise. Oh, wow. Yes. How uh, how did you land that, that position? Well, I had just graduated from acting school in Dallas, Texas, uh, KD Studio, it was mm -hmm. called at the time. I think it's called KD College now. Uh, but it's, uh, it, was, it was just an actor's conservatory at the time. Now they offer film, uh, film programs as well as uh, musical theater programs, which is great. It's a you know, really good school. But anyway, uh, I just graduated. I mean, not maybe two, three weeks before. And I was just getting ready to start finding an agent. I'd gotten a few business cards for after my showcase. Uh, until then, I hadn't had an agent. I didn't, you know, hadn't done enough work to get an agent yet. But finally, uh, I'd done some comedy troops along the way. And uh, at our showcase for acting school, all the agents come to come to see the performances and then if they're interested they give you a, a business card and so I had one and had a few and I I hadn't made the call yet so a faculty member from the school called me about the Barney audition mm -hmm. and so uh, I reluctantly <laughs> went on this audition and sure enough like three callbacks later I booked it that's pretty awesome that must have been pretty uh, physically demanding as well, especially doing a world tour. How, how, how was that on your, on your physique? Like it, it was crazy. Um, well, when the audition, the, the first callback, <clears throat> I actually had to get in the costume for the first time. And mm -hmm. this thing was, uh, I think when I got in it, it was 50 pounds. Oh, it wow. Was all fleece and foam and, uh, and metal. It was like a uh, uh, a jetpack harness, right? And, uh, Fifty pound harness is crazy, right? And then uh, you know, then you're enclosed in this foam and fleece costume, and it's about 120 degrees inside. Jeez! And then oh, you've cool. got to do choreography across a 45 foot stage in arenas all over the all for over the hour, world for hours at a time. For uh, the show was an hour and a half. There were two of us. Uh, before I got hired on, there were only two Barneys, one for the TV show and then one for the special events. Uh, Carrie oh, okay. Stinson was doing special events. Uh, he went on to where, for the longest, uh, from, uh, I, I want to say, 91 to 09. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a long time. But, uh, yeah, so I came on the tour. And um, there were some magical appearances and uh, quick costume changes of Barney's that just weren't possible without an extra person in costume. But also along the way, uh, 
in each city, we went to a hospital. We did hospital visits, uh, oh, went children. to children's hospitals, and uh, and did PR. So while one might have the harder part in the show that night, the other one was doing the hospital visit and uh, television, the PR during the day, and then we'd switch the next day, and then the, you know. Oh, that's kind of cool. All that, yeah, but I I, I gained uh, the after the the first callback I got done and um, <clears throat> I was huffing, <sighs> <laughs> and, uh, and they made That's a comment fun. about it. <clears throat> they made a comment about it, and they still wanted to see me back and told me to get in shape. I was I was I was going to ask that too. You had to get on some kind of regimen to uh, to endure the the role. Well, I was uh, I was one ninety five when I went in to audition. Mm-hmm. And um, I was, I hadn't quite turned 21 yet. I was just about to turn 21. So I had a little bit of college, college weight on me, yeah. <laughs> a little laziness. And, uh, sure, and I had two weeks. No, no, no. I had a week. I had a oh, week wow. to lose 10 pounds and get in shape. It's almost like you're weight cutting at a UFC fighter wrestling well uh, listen i rode uh, we i i live in dallas and uh i rode my bike from our apartment to school and back yeah. and there's no i shouldn't have done it back then and there's definitely no way to do it now oh, uh, <laughs> but i mean i was crossing all kind of streets i was just like dude i gotta do this i mean this there's my only i didn't even i didn't even have a car because I was actually going to school to work out with one of the teachers who was a dancer. And yeah. she was able to decipher uh, the audition tape that they had sent me. Because I didn't know. I just looked like some purple dinosaur jumping around, <laughs> you know? Uh, but sure enough, there were some, there were there was choreography. There were steps and, you know, things Man. that they wanted done. And sure enough, five days or seven days later, I went in and uh you guys hired me are you serious <laughs> yeah it was crazy it, was it must crazy. have been bittersweet you're like oh i got the role but man what what do, what am i gonna have to do like physically you know listen you know at the time i was uh it was a little bittersweet because i had to wait four more months until the job even started oh, let's see okay. that was uh so it was april may june july august five months is when they so gave you a bit of time started. to to get to get in uh, shape then well that was the idea but dude i was i was so i was still poor uh struggling actor yeah um hopping couches and uh still trying to figure it all out and i was really excited oh i booked this part is so great and i had to wait i had to wait five months to do this oh man the the craziest Yeah, it was it was a little it was a little uh, unnerving, but once I got on, it was uh, I can breathe a little bit. Kind of awesome, I bet. Just long I'm enough not- to have to jump in the costume and and not breathe at all because <laughs> it was too hot. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people looking at the show from the outside in probably have no idea just how much it required to put on. You know. You that, wouldn't. Awesome. You probably wouldn't unless you unless you really took the time and overanalyzed it like you probably shouldn't be doing anyway. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. 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 But yeah, it was amazing. Uh our roadies on, on the tour were from rock and roll shows like uh the Rolling Stones, Metallica, Tina oh, wow. Turner, Marilyn Manson, uh all these, you know, our the they had two tour producers. One was from Barney and one was from the rock and roll world. Mm-hmm. And these two people, uh, Sloan Coleman was from Barney world. Jake Berry uh, is still in the rock and roll world. He does U2. And I mean, he's like uh, huge event. Look him up. <laughs> You'll find out this dude is crazy, but you wouldn't know him. No one would know his name regularly. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I'm amongst him. And all of his roadies that he's, you know, he's gathered the A team, you know, 20 of the people in the industry that he knows that he could grab from tours and say, I need you to make this work, you know, and, wow. and they, they did some, 
some hated it more than others, you know, because <laughs> they were from the rock and roll tours. Uh, some embraced it more than others. Some wound up liking it after all. Some, you know, were happy to get on to the next tour. Pardon me. Like a completely uh, so, different scene. Uh, absolutely. You know, all of a sudden it's kids, kids music instead of, instead of uh, death metal and <laughs> instead of underwear getting thrown on the stage. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah. So it was a, it was a great time. I wound up loading out with the roadies or when we loaded out of town. Like I do two shows on Sunday and then put on my street clothes and then go load out with the roadies on go on hang stage. out. Yeah, just because they were all my friends anyway. Mm -hmm. I would go and hang out with them uh, at the bar in the <laughs> hotel at night, you know. And uh, no one was the wiser. Nobody, nobody said anything. And when I hung out with the roadies, uh, they didn't say anything. Like living a double life almost. It was great. It was great. And they loved it too because uh, while I was part of the lead performer role, Mm -hmm. I was not their boss. You know what I mean? Whereas oh, normally yeah. they're on tour with you too. The guy on stage, which is Bono and Edge and the other guys, those are their boss. So, you know, there's a little bit of a, okay, what do I need to do? A little bit more stress involved. Yeah. 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 Whereas, uh, you know, um, there, there was a little tension there about, okay, now what are the, these actors think they're going to come out around here and push us around? And then the next thing you know, I'm just hanging at the bar with them, just going and, and, and loading out. And so we, there was a cool camaraderie there. And I learned tons about the road. You know, I, we wound up going to concerts when their friends were in town with other shows like Aerosmith or Marilyn Manson or, or Rolling Stones or U2, whoever. It was great. It was a great perk. It was a cool perk. Yes. That's, that's, also a cool perk because I bet you took some of that knowledge towards uh, rhyming and stealing, right? Absolutely, yes. I, I mean, it was invaluable because I have a frame of reference of what goes into all of that. And sometimes uh, in the tribute world, uh, some tribute acts, uh, I try not to do this is my point. Some tribute mm -hmm. acts will, will take the, take the gig a little too seriously you know oh yeah you gotta have fun with it and uh or 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 believe that they are the person that they are trying tribute. to tribute <laughs> or or you know whatever cover whatever the case may be and uh and those people they they have a problem and then they wind up not having any idea that the sound guy couldn't give two rips you know what exactly. I mean? Uh, yeah. the, the house guy, he doesn't care. He's just trying to get, you know, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. And I just, I got an idea how that works. I have an idea how the, you know, the paying out at the end of the night works. All that kind of crazy stuff. Good inside knowledge for sure. Absolutely. Now, uh, most of your fans know you for your iconic role as Majin Buu in Dragon Ball. Yes. His voice... Sounds like it's pretty physically demanding. Do you have to give yourself some downtime after recording, or is it something that you eventually became accustomed to? Um, I don't have to do much downtime. If I do it for long, then uh, like after a four-day convention back in the day, yeah. If I did it a lot, if it was a big one and I did it a lot over and over all week and by Sunday, especially, especially because fans want to hear it. And yeah. Oh yeah. All of it. You know, and I'm 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 easy to go. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or you know, at the same, I'm I'm lucky that uh, I get compensated for a lot of that as well. So, sure. but at the end of the day, I'll come home on Sunday night and be like, uh, I, I'm having a hard. I I should not have booked that gig tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have given myself an extra day, but. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I grew up singing, and uh, I kind of know how to. I kind of know how to do that. We're we're all we're all slaves to our uh, our our instruments. We can only do so much, but um, I try to take care of it, and it's not too much of a problem. I've been blessed. 
lemon, honey. Do you have do you have like a like a, like a regimen that you follow? Whiskey and cigarettes. No, I'm kidding. The, the uh, way to go, the rock and roll way to go. Uh, I really don't have a regimen. I drink water. I try to take care of myself. Eat right. Um, I'm not perfect. O o overall maintenance goes yes, a long way. Yes, yes, yes. Just and 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 doing the right, doing the right thing while you're while you're performing and while you're using that so that you don't destroy it. You True. know, you know, just like the. I mean, you know, professional athletes don't don't destroy their ankles or whatever so that they can't play the next game. They, but they play real hard, you know. There's a, yeah, make, makes sense. So it's yeah. kind of like that, kind of like pacing yourself, you know. Uh, something that I, as a fan, think is awesome uh, is your off-screen relationship with Chris Rager, uh, the voice of Hercule. It's almost like we get to see that on-screen friendship perfectly translated in real life. Did you know Chris prior to Dragon Ball or uh, how did that friendship stem? Yes, I met Chris Rager at KD Studio. Oh we yeah. Met way back in 1995. And uh, we were in comedy troops together. And um, after I left for Barney and uh, went out on the road for three years, came back, I came off the road, and I got back with the boys, and we became another comedy troupe called Section 8 Comedy. Eight. Yeah, and uh, but before that, from 95 until then, and then afterwards until, uh, for a, a year. Up until then, uh, Chris and I were roommates for long periods of time. I crashed on his couch. You know, he'd crash with me when I'd have a place, you know, we'd, it was fun. So it's just been a long-standing friendship then? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, since 95. It, I mean, since we started school, um, I was in his class. Uh, I started in 94 and I should have graduated in, in the middle of 95, but I had to take some time off. Oh, I, had to, I had to regroup. <laughs> uh, and, and when I came back, I started with Chris's class and he and I hit it off right, right off the bat. Most Something, all things and just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some it's friendships just are just like, like that. that. You just hit it off with people and it becomes a lifelong thing. That's awesome to see. It's awesome that you, that you kind of stuck with each other and now you're in the same profession too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, see, uh, through the comedy troupe, uh, Mike McFarland was also in that comedy troupe. Oh, wow. Master Roshi and director extraordinaire. Um, yeah. And he was the one who found out about Dragon Ball Z being a local production to us. Mm -hmm. And he learned of an open audition at the time, and he went and booked Master Roshi. Uh, and then told when he came back and told us about it, Rager was like, if Mike can get a part, I can get a part. <laughs> and so sure enough, he went and got uh, Mr. Satan. And over a little bit of time, they had invited, you know, through talking, some of the people from Funimation came out and saw the show or whatever. And, uh, you know, we got we got fairly popular across the street from SMU College in Dallas. Over there in Greenville? Yes, yes. We performed at Ozona Grill and Bar. Oh, and uh, and there, yeah. it's a little Mexican restaurant. And, um, you know, for a few years, uh, all the college kids would come over and have some cocktails and watch us be crazy. And, uh, you know, it worked out. So one night, they brought Sabbath to the show and I was doing my character called the Pillsbury homeboy <laughs> and uh -huh. it, instead of the Pillsbury Doughboy, nothing says nothing like my crescent rolls. <laughs> I did. Uh -huh. Nothing says loving like the blunts I be puffing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be there. Experience that. Yeah. And I redid uh, Snoop Dogg's What's My Name. The whole rap in that voice, all the it, it, in that voice, yes. Oh wow! And so that's why. What's my muffin bacon name? 
Pillsbury, <laughs> homeboy. Oh, exactly. There, there's video. I did an animated version of the of the Pillsbury homeboy. It's on YouTube. I'm gonna have to look that up. I don't yeah, think I've ever seen it. Out. What's my name? And uh, and after the show, Sabbath came to me and said, uh, "I think that voice sounds good for Motion Crew." And I wow. went and read for it, and it, it took like three sessions of them calling me in for me to be convinced that they were going to keep calling me. But uh, you know, apparently they were convinced. I mean, that it, Sabbath had the final say in. He it's, was convinced that it was it's gonna almost work the, from the get go, but it's I almost the perfect transition. Like the voice is incredibly similar. Yeah, yeah, and they're both I kind of from. See, and nobody really. I mean, nobody knows that unless they talk to me and find out this story. But I really went from people think about me going from big and purple to big and pink. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about me be big and big and white. <laughs> in, something in about the, the middle light of tone. it. Just works having nothing to do with my uh, natural complexion. <laughs> so, uh, on a bit of a more serious note, uh, no one yeah. expected to live in a pandemic-style movie in 2020. Uh, how have you coped with the current situation? What are you doing to try and stay busy? Well, uh, luckily, I'm able to continue to audition uh, for for jobs that I normally will do. Uh, and so I'm still able to do those jobs when they arise. And I can book them. Um, I'm also fortunate enough to uh, be involved with the uh, Zobi uh, shout outs and uh, doing cameos as well. Staying in touch wow. with the, uh, the fans, doing autographs and shout outs and, you know, things that we normally do at conventions. Yeah. Um, you know that's crazy uh that's weird uh just trying to trying to navigate just like everybody else trying to navigate the future which is normally difficult enough but yeah, true. you know what well, like Very you say when you f flip the script and make it a, a sharknado all of a sudden are you serious 2020 <laughs> is sharknado for Basically. real we're getting oh, murder hornets, viruses. Murder bees. Yeah, what? <laughs> All of that. So here we are. It's like contagion and idiocracy just kind of fused into Come a movie, on baby. Now, right? Like, right, right. Up. I don't I I had a lot more faith and trust in uh in the human aspect of things. Same. Much much less the uh much less the stuff we can't control, but you know, I, I don't know. I think it's just going to take the good people like us to yeah. At the end of the day, it, you just have to down. Be positive and just worry about what you can control and what you can't. Just kind of let it go by the wayside. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That uh, is it. Touching on conventions, moving forward, how do you think this will affect the convention scene? Like, ideally. Like, I know it's really up in the air, but what's the time frame? Like, when, when are we going to get back to some sort of normal convention style right. like, event? I, as far as a time frame, I don't think there's any way to put a time frame on it. I don't think you can say, well, in 18 months, it'll be good. Yeah, we have no I don't, idea. I, I don't think, uh, based on the virus, it, it seems as though there needs to be a, a vaccine for it before there will be a, uh, a, you know, before you could really move around kind I of like agree. the smallpox was and all that other stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, I, th I, th I, th I think that's your time frame. When there's a vaccine and everybody's got it. How about that? Oh my God, yeah. I forgot about that part. So, and, and I don't know, that's going to be, have to be like a uh, school, some, I don't know. I, anyway, it, I think tough. until then, it's just got to be these, uh, these, these boutique kind of things. Um, otherwise, you're just going to put all those, all those people in 
an already unhealthy situation if I'm being a polite. Agreed. Yeah, there's way too many bodies in one building with recycled air. It's just, it's never been ideal to begin with. And now with something that we can't really there's can't my control. Yes. Wild. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do is go to one convention and take a, take a stroll past the facilities. Yeah. And you'll understand why putting even a thousand, uh, I don't even, I don't even want to say it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And like the, the regulations six feet apart and it, it's a good start, you but know, I don't, don't think do it, it doesn't do anything. Like, there's too many people breathing the same air. Everybody come to a convention and you have to stay six feet apart from the people that you want to pay X amount of dollars to come and see. It's not going to work. No. And then you get, I mean, how many, t and, and bless everybody that goes to the conventions. I love this about conventions. You can smack, I mean, like blast into someone like that and be like, I'm sorry. And, and just keep going. It's not even a, yeah. I was walking here. You know, no, I mean, zero of that. So, yeah. but that happens constantly. Oh, yeah, there's way too many people. So there's no six feet. No. There's no, there no foot. Yeah. They're I like challenge you to sardines. put an inch between yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times, speaking of regular, I just put my hand on his shoulder and just duck down behind him. <laughs> Use them as a behind, just go right behind them. Yes, <laughs> a good strategy. And, or, and then I'll yell, oh, "Move it, move it, move <laughs> it!" Use my roadie voice. That's awesome. You, so basically, what it's gonna come, it's gonna come down to is like we're gonna have to, to adjust, and it's gonna create this virtual convention kind of atmosphere from now on. Well, at least for for the time being. I think the think? safest, best way to do it is gonna be that. I hate, I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, I think the human, human contact in, in all positive ways is, is you know, undeniable. But yeah, I, think uh, I, think, I, I think that as we see, there's going to be a lot of reopenings and a lot of re, uh, going back to's and trying again's. And uh, easy. Yeah. Easy, you know what I mean? It's uh, I know I already see some people acting a fool around here. Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, know where you're at, but I'm, uh, I'm uh, I'm in the Addison area. So, oh, do oh, come on. Oh, you yeah. know, then there's already Karen, Karen's already mad about it. <laughs> you First know what I, mean? I need to speak to a manager right now. Yeah, come on, she's all she hadn't been, she never wore a mask, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh uh. That that whole mass situation is so Don't ridiculous. tread on me. It's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's in place to keep you safe. Like why, why struggle? Yeah. And listen, I'm, I'm with it too. I, yeah. I, I hate it. I don't want to yeah, do sure. it. And, and it has affected how much I'm even willing to do once it's open. Like awesome. Wet and wild's open. I'm not wearing a mask while I go do it. No not, way. Not interested. Yeah. I don't need to go to, I'm not going to go to a water park in the first place, but you get yeah. the point. You know what I'm saying? That's just me. Yeah. I think this, this might be our new normal for a while, but humans, humans adapt. So I, I think eventually like, we'll, we'll well, it, we, I mean, come on necessity, the mother of invention, you wait exactly. till it, it already showing itself, but it, it should be interesting to see how the masses, uh, and the regulations go because you can't you can't do this public thing half half and half. You're gonna make people sit six feet apart at a restaurant, but when I go to the grocery store, I can say, "Excuse me, grab the pasta and difference, difference, yeah. difference." No, no. No, you might, there might be a, 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 a greater rate of fluid transfer or, you know, the ability to transfer that by airflow, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a scientist, don't have the best words. 
don't have the best words. I'm also <laughs> not the president. No, uh, um, thank God. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I digress. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I, I don't. I don't know what's. Per it's not. There's not a perfect solution. I also wish that uh, the people that we trusted to already have a good handle on this before it got out of hand. Agreed. That's already too. been done. But then on top of it, <clears throat> don't seem to be catching up on on that end. Like we all said, oh my God, okay, yeah, we'll eat, uh, uh, you know, whatever we got in the pantry and and take baths after we use the restroom and you know what I mean, whatever we got to do. And then yeah. the next thing you know, after after everyone's done that. You see that, okay, obviously it's not going to be able to spread the thing. What the were you guys doing while we did all that? Except for having press conferences about, oh, well, we didn't, oh, well, we thought, well, we stop all that. No, just. <laughs> it was almost like. Roll up the sleeves and get to work, son. It was, it was almost like too little, too late by the time. Yeah, well, now it is. Yeah. Now, and now it is. Yeah, that that's honestly why we're, I feel like we're, we're in the position that we're in now. I feel like it could have been a lot better, like cases might have been a lot lower, but it's just reaction time was just not there. Uh, and on top of it, how do you say, okay, guys, you know what? You need to all stay home now. Yeah. And then two weeks later go, okay, hey, listen, um, you're going to have to stay at home for six more weeks and we're going to try to get some money to you. You knew, and we know now that you've been knowing and could already sort it out. Guys, Financial. here's what's going to happen for the next eight weeks. You're going to sit at home, and right now you're going to start the process of filing for unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. We got all this in place. We're going to find out how it got spread. Once we do that, we're going to work on some vaccines. It's going to take a little bit. It's going to take time until we do. And this is how we're going to do that. And we're going to and do all that eight weeks ago. Exactly. Instead of act, instead of all of a sudden, Oh, well, I thought the kids were going to stay inside <laughs> when I left for the bar. Yeah. I didn't know they were going to run all over the, you know what I mean? Now, now all of a sudden, okay, well, you're just going to stay in this house. Nobody's going to go anywhere until I figure out what happened. Yeah. You went to the bar, dad. That's what it, you know what I mean. In a perfect yeah. world, that's what it would take, and that's what would, what would help curb the situation. But like controlling three hundred and thirty million Americans and telling them to stay inside just is not feasible. Like, well, that too. I just yeah. think that there was also some uh, some upper management things that could have been should have been done that way in advance. Yeah, yeah that you already you're already um, taking into consideration the idiot Amer the idiot humans. Yeah, unfortunately. Us idiot humans. Yeah. I'm there. I'm I gotta be I'm a perfect human. <laughs> I make mistakes all the time. Exactly. Well hopefully so, I things will get better from now. From here on out. We can only hope and just just keep doing what you're doing to keep yourself safe, you and your family. That's, That's it. You do. too, man. Absolutely. Yeah. No question. So uh I have loved tuning in to your your live streams, you and Chris's uh, cocktail, Thank you. cocktail live stream. Thank you. It's fun. And uh, hearing your new music that you've been putting out, that's super entertaining. Uh, I have to ask, any new songs in the works? Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, there's a new song uh, in the work. And uh, I'm trying to figure out the best video to put on it. Ah, it's, it's silly. And uh, to add to what you asked what I've been doing in my free time, in my quarantine time, um, I, I think that I've found out, uh, and this is an exclusive for you, Lupe, uh, oh, that awesome. uh, uh, I'm finding out that no matter what I do, how I try to ignore it, read, do something else, I am always going to be creative. It just, yeah. it just happens. Just who you I are. Can't it. And so... This song, like this these these last two songs I put out about the the toilet paper and the dance party, 
You know, yeah. I'm just like, I, I, I can't do anything. Y'all got me stuck at the house. I can't even go see my people tell me how good I am, you know, at conventions. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm, I'm used to always performing for them and my friends. And, you know, my family gets tired of me quick. <laughs> They're, They're like, around me all the time because, you, you know, you at the house? I, well, it is, so but, you know, I also got to be the maintenance guy and the, the dad. So I got to do dad things like pick that up and don't do that. You didn't, why didn't you? And, you know, so, so when I don't do that, all of a sudden I'm, I'm creative. I'm making, making songs, but yeah, this next one, this next one's, it's out there. It's a little, it's a little, it's not as as, uh, straightforward, but it's fun. It it was fun. It's fun. Quarantine's gotten those creative juices and all of us just grabbed it. I can't help it. I can't help it. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad about it, though, to be honest. I don't know what else I'd do. I'm, I'm actually enjoying it because, like, man, there's, there's like, games and manga, so many things that I can't even touch on a daily basis, and now it's there, and I'm like, oh, I have time. So That's crazy. awesome. Good for you. Enjoy it. All right. Well, one, of, one of the last topics I'm going to touch on, uh, uh-huh. I know you're also a fan of wrestling. Uh, how weird has it been to witness events going on without a crowd? Uh, do you think they should have held off until the crowds returned or is the entertainment they're providing necessary during these times? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes to all of it. I think um, it's weird because I'm an old, old time, old school fan from I think I figured, I I feel like I've been watching it for forever, but I think I figured out that I started watching it about eight or nine years old with my papa. Hmm. Uh, I just, I never saw him get so into something and get so riled up and enjoy something. And just, it cracked me up. He would squirm and get all into the, you know. Someone was there. Yeah, and then he would, you know, he'd giggle when when somebody was cutting a promo, you know, when Ric Flair was cutting a promo. And sure enough, I was watching uh, Mid South Championship Wrestling oh, wow. uh, in back. Monroe, Louisiana, with my papa. I figured that out since I didn't, I wasn't savvy enough to, yeah. to get all that information. But um, anyway, I'm. A, I'm a kind of a an old school guy at heart, but at the same time, I like the fact that it has lasted for forever. You know, I mean, yeah. it has lasted this yeah. long, and and that's because of innovation and change, agreed, and yeah. adaptation to the times and the situations, and. Uh, a lot of some of it has been entertaining to me, to be honest. You know, even some and and some of the non wrestling has been entertaining. Like uh, I appreciate all all parts of all aspects of the art form. Like yeah. I like the in ring athleticism and the storytelling and uh, promos and the and the entertainment promo part of it and the pomp and circumstance and the you know, the big, you know, the flair of it, you know, pyro and all of that stuff. I love all of that. But, um, and so sometimes when there's not the audience there to enjoy it, a a couple of seconds, I think, oh, wow, this is just like back in the day when they did it in a studio with like 10 people in the stands, right? True, Um, but the problem is, is that they didn't scale the production down there, right? Yeah. They, they if they'd have put it down, them. if they'd have kept those cameras, bang. All right, I'm, I'm not going to show that. Even if you show the ring, you got to put those blind. I mean, hey, I, I'm not in production, so it's not my deal. But I just, uh, I, I, was a, I think that it might have been a little uh, better. It could be better for anyone who cares to listen to bring that focus in a little more and just concentrate on this is what's going on. Yeah, true. Just show the ring. Like, cause they, yeah. I, I think the first event they had, they showed the empty crowd and everything was lit up. It was weird. Yes. Yes. 
if, uh, if you can if you can get some of the guys, if you can get catering, some of the people to get in the get in the stands and just do a a two row. I mean, do you remember? I don't know if you ever seen. Go back and look at the Mid South. I'm not joking you. There's two rows of chairs on a flat floor, and that was they it. are in a sound stage where a news program could be produced. Right? Yeah. I mean, it barely fits a ring. And these guys are, you know, it, it's crazy. So I, th- I think it could be done. A lot of the cinematic stuff they're doing now, I like. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not wrestling, but they're doing great. You yeah, know, it's, I mean, more- it's, a, it's a great production, uh, you know. And, but it, it goes back to, I love Jim Cornette. I'm an old Jim Cornette fan. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I love his vim and vigor and, you know, it, all that. But what cracks me up is how just adamant that this new wrestling with all the flippy crap <laughs> and very you, show, you know, you, you got a child out there in the ring trying to wrestle and a, hey, I mean, he's no bigger than a thimble. You, <laughs> you know what I mean? But these guys are doing different makeup and stuff and, and cosplay and I call it fake rest or whatever, you know, it, it yeah, cracks me up because I'm thinking, do you know how many of the old guys looked at what you guys were doing with the tennis racket with fuzzy crap? You know what I mean? Yeah, you're old school and you know the deal. But, you know, back in the day. It was more pure. They wouldn't. Like, it, if you're doing this interview right now, you'd be like, you'd be shot. No, him, the meaning. If Jim Cornette's doing any kind of interview that isn't about the fact that I'm a mean manager, uh, they'd they'd shun him because that ain't wrestling. It was more about the actual wrestling than it was about the showy, flashy aspect of it that it is now. It was about fooling the the carnival goers that I could beat you because I'm the biggest. And you just happen to be walking through and, well, I'll take him on. Come on in. Meanwhile, <laughs> the promoter, the carnival promoter, has paid you to walk through the line every other time. You know what? That's True. what it was about. That's what the art of wrestling is, to fool people into thinking it's a real fight. Yeah. That, that's another thing, too. Now that the crowd isn't there, the production's a lot different, you can actually see how, like, the blows aren't landing. You can see the tricks of the trade. Like, they're more out there now. And see, this is where I do agree with the Jim Cornette in that if you, can, if you concentrate more on telling the story in the, the old school form, uh, then those flippy moves or, you know, whatever, or those, those chops or, you know, whatever, those weird un, untraditional moves mean more. True. Yeah. Uh, but, but a lot of it, there, it's gotten to where okay, I need to put in so many moves. I got to put in so much stuff. And they talk through it so much. That this is this is a problem in acting. This is a problem in acting, stage acting, especially. You walk through it. Okay, I come in here. I pick up the cup. Take a drink. I tell you, I'm going and blah 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 and this, Mm -hmm. and then I leave the room. Well, you do that too much. Next thing you know, you come to the stage. You come in. I tell you this, and I'm very I'm I'm disengaged. Yeah, because you're like monotonous into that routine. Yeah, I'm going through the motions. Yeah. And this is when I pick up the glass, and this is when I drink, and this, and then, and then it just looks like rote. And you can tell there's no, you can tell there's no liquid in the glass, because there's no liquid in the glass, because I'm, yeah. I'm pretending. I almost <laughs> dropped it because I forgot to pick it up, because I never pick it up. And you know what I mean? But I yeah, can there's... see people, I can see people mocking. Uh, pushing someone through the rope to the rope. It's almost like too instead much of a script. Of, instead of I'm Irish whipping your ass into the rope, and you're gonna sling back at me. I really, really re- believed all this time until 
a few years ago that th there was some elasticity of the ropes. Yeah. I mean, like a, a bungee type elasticity. <laughs> you know, because that was the deal. You get slung in and then, you know. Yeah. You... But now I can see, uh, th and this is where I go and you do this and then we fake. And that's why a lot of things are botched. Exactly. Yeah. Too much to the script, not enough free flowing, like purity of wrestling. That's, that's kind of what it is. I loved George the Animal Steel. You uh, ever know him? I, I did not. I'm not familiar with him. Sorry. That's an oi. And he never said anything but Elizabeth. He had big feuds with, against Randy Savage and with him. But oh. he was just, he was an old guy and he had a hairy back, bald head, and he had a green tongue and he never said anything. Huh. Almost he, like the cane type. <laughs> but he was like, kind of, it, it might be a little offensive today to some people that, might think he's being a bit, but it was different times. Yeah, exactly. But the, my point is, is he never said anything, but there were times where I, Oh, I feared him. Just and from then the other answer. times I was like, yes, yeah, he did it. Yeah. And he did it on purpose. And he did it with, you know, and then years later he retired. Uh, and sure enough, for years, he was an elementary school teacher. Oh, wow. That would go and wrestle on the weekends and did his best to stay hidden. Double life. Yeah, and was great until he got to WWF. And people were like, that's, that's when the see you on Saturday night's main event. It's in, a, it's in a video someplace of his. Anyway, I digress. It's like, that's my teacher. <laughs> that's what somebody, somebody saw him. There's an interview someplace. Uh, somebody saw him at a match. How wild is that? Like, and they, they pointed at him out and he was, and he, you know, he was stayed, he stayed in character. It's almost like watching a Parks and Rec where the guy has a double life. He's a saxophone player at the, <laughs> by yeah, night. Right, right, right. Yeah. Pretty awesome. All right. Well, Josh, thank you so much. For talking to me for so long. Uh, Thank you, man. I enjoyed it. Good to see you. Your time. Good to you. Uh, stay safe. These these are wild times. Same uh, to you, man. Keep those creative juices going. We are all enjoying the content you and Chris are putting out. It, you're keeping the fans like entertained during these hard times. We thank you, bottom of our heart. Thanks for letting us. We appreciate y'all. Y'all stay right, well. Man. Be well. And. Uh, Meet you up. <laughs> Chocolate. There you go. You know hopefully, it. Hopefully we'll get to see you at a convention for like in the near future. So hopefully so. If not, y'all you know, check me out. Zoby shout outs if you need something signed and shout it out. Cameo. We're doing live streams on Twitch here soon. Awesome. Uh, uh, I'll be sure to include all that in the uh, description below. So if anybody wants you, to check out Josh's content, it'll be linked below. Uh, go check out some of the awesomeness that's being put out during this quarantine, during these hard times. And yeah, stay entertained and stay safe, everyone. Thanks again, Josh. It means a lot. Thank you, Lupe. Be well. All right. Thank you all so much for watching that interview with Josh Martin. Thank you again, Josh, for the interview. It was a pleasure. As always, guys, please like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the little bell so you're notified every time I drop a brand new video. And yeah, stay safe out there. Wash your hands. And I'll see you on the next one. Peace.